Tonight, a holiday beachside mass shooting. Nine people, including a child, were wounded when gunfire erupted in Hollywood, Florida, sending people running frantically for cover. What police are saying about their ongoing investigation and video from the scene as chaos ensued. Plus, I'm not going to accept it. We'll have to get rid of this problem for good. It's a centuries-old system that divides people in society into different classes and treats those who aren't toward the top as less than. It's the caste system, and it's still alive and well today. In our prime focus of the night, we talk to those looking to abolish it once and for all. And... So you can see it's a really great neighborhood. Oh, yeah, it's a great park. The house the has great bones. Oscar Award winner Patricia Arquette joins us to talk about her latest project and the road that got her there in tonight's Streamline. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We're following those stories and much more, including a devastating apartment building collapse in Iowa with search and rescue teams on site working day and night to find those still missing. Plus, Congress possibly on the verge of raising the debt ceiling after a deal over the holiday weekend was hammered out. We'll speak to one of the lawmakers announcing they'll vote against that deal. And terrifying moments on the high seas, the footage that shows the moments a cruise ship sailed into rough waters during a storm on the last night of its voyage. Our correspondents are fanned out across the country covering those stories and more for us tonight. But we do begin with the fallout after that apartment building collapse in Iowa and the perilous situations rescuers face tonight. At any moment, that building could come crashing down, but there may still be people left inside. The building in Davenport, Iowa, collapsed Sunday afternoon. Tonight, five people remain unaccounted for. The building was slated to be demolished today, but those plans were scrapped by the city after a ninth survivor was rescued from an apartment on Monday. Day. Late today, officials announced that they were able to rescue several animals and crews have continued to search for human activity. But they do acknowledge the stability of the building continues to, quote, degrade, presenting quite the conundrum. With more rescues, there is grave risk. Alex Perez leads us off tonight from Davenport, Iowa. Tonight in Davenport, Iowa, there are growing calls for authorities to keep searching this collapsed apartment building for residents who are still missing. The frickin' building just collapsed. Less than 24 hours after part of this building crumbled to the ground, rescue operations were called off after search dogs, drones, and thermal imaging found no signs of life. But tonight, in about face, the city putting plans to demolish the building on hold. At an emotional press conference, officials now acknowledging five residents are unaccounted for, including Ryan Hitchcock and Brandon Colvin, who they believe are still in the building. We're very sympathetic. To the possibility that there's two people, that there's two people still left inside. She is alive. It comes hours after Lisa Brooks was finally able to reach her phone to call for help. Rescuers working up against an unsteady building to get her to safety. I was just so afraid that I was gonna die and don't see my kids, my grandkids. Brandon Colvin's aunt wants crews to keep searching. And up there where you see those clothes hanging neatly, that was just a problem. Knowing that the city was considering demolishing this as early as today. It's like burying them. The cause of the collapse is now under investigation. The building had a history of complaints. And last week, this section of the exterior wall was being repaired. The repair, it seems, was too late. Alex Perez joins us now from the scene. Alex, officials have said that that building is in imminent danger of collapse. So how does the city now move forward with a safe search? Well, Lindsay, authorities right now say they're focusing on finding a safe way to conduct another search of this building. They're considering all options, including using drones. Now, several animals were rescued during a partial search this afternoon, but there were no signs of human activity during that search. Lindsay? Alex Perez for us from Iowa. Thanks so much, Alex. This Memorial Day weekend was particularly violent this year with at least 17 mass shootings, one of them in Hollywood, Florida. You can see the moment gunshots rang out on the Hollywood boardwalk, prompting people to run for their lives. Nine people were wounded, including a one-year-old child in what police believe was a dispute between two groups. Tonight, they're asking for the public's help to find the suspects. ABC's Victor Kendo is there, and a warning, some of the images may be disturbing. 
Tonight, the urgent manhunt for the gunman who opened fire along a crowded Florida beach, sending dozens of Memorial Day revelers running in terror. Five adults and four children shot, the youngest just one year old. And tonight, police releasing dramatic calls to 911. And there's people out here that just got shot in Hollywood Beach. People are all hiding up against the walls. There's a bunch of little kids outside. Authorities in Hollywood, north of Miami, now asking for the community's help to identify these three people they believed are involved in the shooting. When you do something like this in broad daylight with CCTV cameras up and down our broadwalk, you will be identified and you will be caught and brought to justice. Those cameras on the Hollywood Beach broadwalk Catching the moment gunfire erupted Monday night, police say after an altercation between two groups. I heard like, pop, 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 like about six, seven shots. Everybody start running. Graphic video showing first responders and beachgoers treating the wounded. Kayla Puzan is pregnant and had to duck for cover. You're five months pregnant. A shooting happens feet away from you. How scary was that? Extremely scary. I was looking forward to being here next year with my own child. And now I have to question even coming here on the holidays. Many people assume that the beach is a family-friendly place. Victor Kendo joins us. Now, Victor, what's on the latest on the ground there? Lindsay, here in Hollywood, police have arrested two people, but they are still searching for three more. And tonight, the staggering death toll nationwide, 175 people shot and killed this holiday weekend. Lindsay? We see that police presence right behind you there. Victor, thank you. Next, 11-year-old Adarian Murray is speaking out for the first time after a terrifying encounter with police in Mississippi. Murray was shot by police after calling 911 in the early morning hours of May 20th. Murray's mother told him to call the police after she heard a knock on their window and saw her ex-boyfriend standing outside. ABC's DeMarco Morgan sat down with Adarian. I came out doing this, so I ran across the corner, and then I just got shot. And then I ran to, to my mom. And then so I was bleeding from, from my mouth. Then my mama, she was applying pressure to my chest. The results of the investigation will be shared with the Mississippi Attorney General's office, according to the Mississippi Bureau of Investigation. Adarian's mother is now calling for the officer to be fired. Now to Washington, where the debt ceiling agreement reached over the Memorial Day weekend between President Biden and House Speaker McCarthy is facing a major test of support before a full House vote. Both sides are trying to sell the deal to their members to try to get it across the finish line to avoid a catastrophic default. ABC's senior congressional correspondent Rachel Scott has the very latest. Now that President Biden and House Speaker Kevin McCarthy have struck a deal to avoid a catastrophic default, the challenge, getting it through Congress. And tonight, fierce resistance from some of the most conservative House Republicans, the Freedom Caucus. I want to be very clear. Not one Republican should vote for this deal. Yes. Not one. The two-year deal would claw back $30 billion in COVID relief, rescind $20 billion in IRS funding, end Biden's freeze on student loan repayments in August, and add new work requirements for some Americans on food assistance. Conservative Republicans say it doesn't go nearly far enough. You read the bill, yeah. and where do you stand? It's a terrible bill, plain and simple. And you're a firm no? Unless something changes on the bill, yeah, absolutely, I'm triple no. You said that Republicans were outsmarted by Democrats. Yeah, they got, we got fleeced uh, 100%. Some Republicans saying McCarthy himself should go. The speaker brushing it off. What's your message to some of the holdouts, Republicans who say that Republicans were outsmarted in this deal? That's interesting. So how were we outsmarted? The largest cut in the history of Congress, the biggest ability to pull money back. Tonight, at least 25 House Republicans say they will vote against the bill, which means McCarthy will need Democratic votes to get it over the finish line. But House progressives aren't sold. Many progressives, including me, lean no, uh, because the bill does contain taking some folks like 53 and 54 year olds off of their food stamps. Rachel Scott joins us now from the Capitol. Rachel, this bill will need bipartisan votes to pass the House. What's the timeline looking like to try to get this across the finish line? 
Well, Congress will really have to move quickly on this one before the nation runs out of money to pay its bills by June 1st. So the House is expected to vote on this bill tomorrow. Leaders are confident that they have enough support in order for it to pass the House, and then it will head over to the Senate, where leaders will certainly try to fast track this bill, but they will need some buy-in from all 100 senators. That remains to be seen. I can tell you the senators are bracing for possibly a very long weekend, Lindsay. All right, we can imagine. Rachel Scott from the Capitol for us. Thanks so much, Rachel. The next few days will certainly be critical as House Speaker Kevin McCarthy is counting the votes to try to get his bill across the finish line. So I want to bring in Republican Congresswoman Nancy Mace from South Carolina's first congressional district, who's been an outspoken opponent of this bill. Congresswoman, thanks so much for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me this evening. This bipartisan deal struck over the weekend has concessions from both sides, uh, yet you say that your fellow Republicans were, quote, outsmarted by the White House's negotiating team. What's missing from this deal that would turn your vote around? Well, actual spending cuts are what's missing because in this bill, there's actually no cap on the debt ceiling for the next two years. It actually adds $4 trillion to the debt based on the spending that is in the bill. And the other thing is that they are saying the clawbacks, the rescissions, getting unspent COVID funds from the state, that that's a cut. That's not a cut. That's not what the American people are asking for. 63% of Americans want to see the federal government be more responsible with the money that it spends. They want to see spending cuts. And this bill, does not do it. What kind of cuts would you like to see? Well, any kind of spending cuts at this point, we need to go back to pre-COVID levels. We saw record spending, emergency spending, uh, upwards of 40% or $2 trillion over the last, uh, 2019 to 2023. Uh, we're averaging about $6 trillion a year in spending. We need to go back to pre-COVID levels, which is about $4.5 trillion. We need to show the American people that we will spend what we bring in. That's what I'm trying to teach my teenage kids, to live within your means. The federal government should do the same. You're part of a growing coalition of Republicans who have publicly stated that you will not support this deal as is. Economists, as you well know, predict dire consequences globally if, this, if the U.S. doesn't pass this bill. Are you willing to let the nation go into default? We're not going to go into default. That is just a scare tactic by the left. We have enough revenue coming in to cover our interest on the debt. That's not what's at stake here. If we were to not pass this bill, and I think this bill passes tomorrow, but if that were to happen, if we were to not pass the bill, we would just have to prioritize our spending by putting priority, obviously, on the interest on the debt and maybe not pay for a few wasteful programs. I mean, that's how this works. Uh, we don't need to get the, the economy. Uh, we don't need to, you know, really scare people or use that as a scare tactic because that's not what's going to happen. Is here. it a scare tactic from the left? I mean, uh, Janet Yellen has said very clearly that as of June 5th, we'd run out of money that we wouldn't be able to pay our bills. Well, again, we have enough revenue coming in to cover our bills, starting with the interest on the debt, and we would have to prioritize our spending. If that means a couple of wasteful programs don't get, don't get uh, paid for, I'm okay with that. I think most Americans would be. America wants us to cut spending. Congressman Dan Bishop has said nobody could have done a worse job about Kevin McCarthy and the negotiating team, and has said that this deal could be grounds for Speaker McCarthy's removal. Do you agree with him, and would you vote to make that happen? Calls for remo removal are premature at this juncture, but I'll just say this. I, I've been up here two and a half years. I, this is one of the worst bills I've ever seen. Uh, things that we were told as members from leadership ended up not being true. And I'm not going to lie to the American people. I'm not going to lie to South Carolinians. I'm also not going to lie to my colleagues up here, which is why I read the bill multiple times uh, over. I read it twice. And some of it, I couldn't believe the fine print. I said, you've got to be kidding me. I want to switch gears for a moment. You serve in a swing district and on certain issues you push back against your party and have called some stances too extreme, specifically on abortion rights and gun control mm -hmm. legislation. Uh, you've said that your party will lose seats with extreme abortion bans and lack of progress on gun control measures. What are you doing to try to convince fellow Republicans to move to the center of these issues? I've been a strong, outspoken advocate for women. I want to show that I support women, I support women's rights, and I support the right to life. The two are not mutually exclusive. I have multiple pieces of legislation that address the rate kit backlog that we have today. I've got multiple bills addressing adoption services, foster care, child care, birth control, et cetera. We need to show that we care about women if we want to get serious about winning in 2024. When it comes to violence, unfortunately, South Carolina 
is no stranger to mass shootings. In fact, my kids and I were near a mass shooting a few weeks ago. I, I'm a pro 2 a advocate. I have seven guns. I carry one with me because of the threats I receive as a member of Congress. But I also know that we can do things like strengthen our background checks, have an amber alert system. So if you're near a mass shooting, you can be forewarned, maybe not to leave the premises or to take cover wherever you are. There are a lot of middle ground, common sense measures, whether, whether we're talking about violence or we're talking about women's issues, but we can find that middle ground. Congresswoman Nancy Mace, always appreciate your time. Thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you. Next tonight, to the war in Ukraine, drones have hit residential areas in Moscow for the first time in this conflict. One is hit near Putin's country home. You can see smoke from that explosion over the skyline. Russia is blaming Ukraine for the strike. Ukraine denies it. The question now is how will Putin respond? ABC's Tom Sufi Burridge reports in from Ukraine. Tonight, Russia promising the toughest possible response after a wave of explosive drones hit a wealthy district of Moscow. Explosions only three miles from President Putin's country residence. Here, a drone clearly visible. Russia saying there were eight in total. These videos circulating online, this one appearing to show Moscow's air defense in action, shooting most of them down. A Ukrainian official suggesting it's now not just Ukraine that can be bombarded by drones. Russian President Vladimir Putin calling it a terrorist attack. Waves of Russian missiles and drones striking Kiev three nights running. This apartment blown away, a woman killed, with fighting escalating on the front lines. We're with a Ukrainian tank brigade. Their tanks are hidden in the trees just back from the front lines. We can hear intense artillery fire not far from here. And these guys are waiting for the command to move. Ukraine getting ready for a major offensive. That offensive highly anticipated now. Tom Sufi Burridge joins us tonight from northeastern Ukraine near the border with Russia. Tom, what is the U.S. saying about today's drone strike in Moscow? Lindsay, the Biden administration is saying we do not support attacks inside Russia, but also emphasizing Ukraine is under constant attack and Moscow can end the war by withdrawing its forces from Ukraine. Lindsay? Tom Sufi Burridge for us. Thanks so much, Tom. Staying overseas where there's been a close encounter between a Chinese fighter jet and a U.S. military aircraft in international airspace over the South China Sea. Cockpit video shows the Chinese jet flying across the path of the U.S. plane just 400 feet away. A move the Pentagon is calling unnecessarily aggressive. Here's ABC's chief global affairs correspondent Martha Raddatz. The U.S. has seen an alarming increase in confrontations with Chinese aircraft, and this over the South China Sea, caught on camera. This military video showing U.S. Air Force pilots watching the Chinese fighter jet rapidly approach, then roar past the U.S. reconnaissance plane within 400 feet of its nose, forcing it to bounce through the turbulence of the fighter jet's wake. U.S. Indo-Pacific Command calling the Chinese maneuver in international airspace unnecessarily aggressive. A senior defense official saying they do not believe these actions are rogue pilots acting independently, but rather part of a wider pattern of aggressive intercepts in the region. U.S. military officials have publicly voiced concern over these incidents, knowing that they are dangerous and could lead to more serious consequences. Lindsay? Martha, thank you. A Virginia man has been arrested for the murder of New Jersey Councilwoman Eunice uh, Dwumfor, who was gunned down outside of her home in February. Dwumfor, a 30-year-old mother and church leader, was shot multiple times while she was in her SUV outside of her townhouse. Middlesex County prosecutor announced the suspect, 28-year-old Rashid Ali Bynum, apparently knew Dwumfor from church. He had been taken into custody on charges, including first-degree murder. Officials have not identified a possible motive. Theranos founder Elizabeth Holmes is spending her first night in federal prison tonight after the former billionaire reported to a minimum security all women's prison in Texas today following multiple delays. Now the mother of two young children, she was accompanied by her parents and partner before surrendering to begin serving an 11-year sentence for famously defrauding investors out of millions of dollars. Next tonight, to news involving former First Lady Rosalind Carter. Her family says that she's been diagnosed with dementia, but that she is living happily at home with her husband. The former president has been receiving hospice care for months now. Our senior national correspondent Steve Osinsami reports. She was still in the White House more than 40 years ago when she was trying to get the world to think of mental health issues like any other disease. 
And tonight, she's continuing that work with news of her own, that the former First Lady, Rosalind Carter, has dementia. In a statement, the Carter Center says she continues to live happily at home with her husband, enjoying spring. She is living the lesson of destigmatizing, taking care of yourself, caregivers, mental health, and the discomfort that people feel when they need to approach this. She's testified more than once before Congress, talking about the support that caregivers need when they have family suffering from dementia. The stress of caring for a person with dementia negatively impacts the caregiver's immune system for up to three years after caregiving ends. Theirs is a love story, and their last interview together was this one on their 75th wedding anniversary. Number 77 is in July. Staying with me all this long has been the most wonderful thing in my life. He's pretty wonderful in my life, too. Our thanks to Steve for that. Still much more to get to here on Prime tonight. Coming up, a dirty sight on Mount Everest. Why officials are having a hard time preventing trash equipment and abandoned tents from piling up. Plus, video shows just how rough this he's got on a cruise ship, rocking passengers and sending water into their cabins. But next in our Prime Focus, a closer look at a generations-old form of discrimination that originated in South Asia, the movement to stop the caste system from spreading throughout the United States. There, my colleagues, my co-workers, who were from Nepal, like, you know, who were from dominant caste, like, they refused to share, like, you know, that room because of my caste identity. I used to cry, you know, like, almost is every day. So, uh, I, I felt very low and, like, you know, unworthy. Whenever news breaks, to crush the families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. So much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. At a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Welcome back to Prime. Caste is a generations old form of discrimination, a way to marginalize someone in a social hierarchy based on their birth. Originating in South Asia, some say caste discrimination has made its way here to the United States. And now a movement is underway to add caste as a protected class to state and city's anti-discrimination laws. But not everyone is supportive of the efforts, saying that it just brings attention to a painful practice of the past. Arena Roy traveled to the West Coast to get firsthand accounts from people who say they've suffered from caste discrimination. When I think about the suffering of my people, it causes such a deep pain in my heart. The caste discrimination has become a predominant problem in the U.S. and it has to be addressed legally. 
and it's very painful because it's not just slurs and bullying and inter, you know taunts between people. It's structural discrimination. A lot of people are getting housing discrimination, discrimination in jobs like restaurant workers, Uber drivers, on top of people who are in tech and medicine. It happens in America here. Now, caste, like uh, race and class, is a social relationship. And caste operates as an engine of social hierarchy and as a form of political and economic inequality. Oh, this, 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 guy, guy. this guy, what's his name? The guy. You guys have a of they call us a lower caste. In school, our kids, they get into discrimination. In the colleges, workplaces, they're not getting promotion. Like everywhere. It's a form of what we call heritable hierarchy, that is, you're born into caste, which means that caste has consequence for who has inherited privilege and who suffers historical discrimination. The caste system is an ancient social construct that started in South Asia more than 3,000 years ago. Alok Kumbare was born into the lowest caste, the Dalits, or so-called untouchables. As a young child, I was really interested in music, like, wanted to learn music. But when we started the conversation with the teacher, the questions that he asked me, right, what is your last name? What do your parents do? And then he goes and tells me, hey, maybe music is not for everyone. For Did you feel so. it was because of your caste? It was definitely because of my class. Like, he started with asking my last name, right? Like, that's how, that is one of the key markers of uh, uh, caste in India. The ways in which caste operates in subtle and not so subtle ways. People trying to figure out what your caste is uh, through your last name. All trying to get a sense of, you know, uh, ways in which you can cut into somebody's caste identity. This implicit notion of um, superiority and inferiority, right, creeps in all the time. The landlady that I was renting from, she was really hostile. She said to me, I should have asked your caste before I rented a room to you. She told me, <laughs> you stink up the toilet too much, I should have made you clean it, that's what you're good for. Right, that was the... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's still hard to talk about all these years later. Many of the untouchable castes have a historic uh, relationship with things like uh, working with leather, which is defiling labor, uh, removing dead carcasses, and manual scavenging. What you would have are uh, communities that uh, carried what we call night soil, literally, if you will excuse me, human, <laughs> uh, on their heads, right? Many say similar caste-based beliefs are still prevalent today, even thousands of miles from its origin. Here we are also seeing what I will call American caste. And it is happening as a kind of carryover of the past. Dr. Anupama Rao is a history professor at Columbia University with a focus on South Asia. So what does caste look like? Sort of in a kind of normative sense, caste uh, has Brahmins or ritual specialists on top. You have so-called kshatriyas, warrior castes, those who wield the sword, involved in warfare, who are kind of second in that hierarchy. You have the mercantile castes, uh, kind of, uh, you know, commercial communities called Vaishyas. And then the majority of uh, the, the, the population belongs to agrarian and artisanal communities, the so-called Shudra castes. Now, the outcasts, the so-called uh, untouchables, uh, the term today is Dalit, which is a term uh, of militant self-identification. It means ground down, broken, crushed. And it's a term that the community has used in order to think about a politics of recognition, of dignity, and of demanding social, political, and civil rights. In 1948, a year after independence from British rule, India banned discrimination on the basis of caste in its constitution. With the help of Dr. Bhimrao Ramji Ambedkar, a civil rights leader from the Dalit caste. But culturally, many say caste discrimination still exists. My family members, including my dad, my mom, and my sister, they were like, you know, physically assaulted. They were brutally attacked. Prem Pariyar was born in Nepal into the same caste, fleeing after his family was brutally attacked in an argument with a group from the dominant caste. Their story broadcast on Nepalese news. 
While seeking political asylum in the U.S., he says he faced similar discrimination in California's Bay Area. So I got a job in uh, in a restaurant. This is very painful to talk about, you know. So uh, generally, restaurant owners, they provide shared housing for the workers. And uh, there, my colleagues, my co-workers, who were from Nepal, like, you know, who were from dominant caste, like, they refused to share, like, you know, that room because of my caste identity. Uh, after a month, like, I, I, I was homeless almost because I was in a van and I felt, like, insecure that time. That makes me cry. That makes me cry. <sighs> But people, when we talk about our personal experience, they don't believe it. This people is... don't believe your experience. Exactly. Not only my experience, our experience, our people's experience. Cast even considered in the most intimate parts of people's lives. Something like Indian matchmaking. Well, the big unspoken there is that they're looking for marriages within their caste. It's mentioned within the first four minutes of the hit Netflix series. In India, we have to see the cast, we have to see the height, we have to see the age. How about this? Intercaste marriage often frowned upon, causing rifts between families like Promila's. Both sides of our families didn't agree to our marriage. You're saying you're not going to accept anything like that? No, I'm not going to accept it. We'll have to get rid of this problem for good. We come to U.S. with the hope of having a better life for ourselves and our children. We don't want to come here and be discriminated all over again. We shall live. Go ahead, no divide. We shall live. Go ahead, no Then Maury Sandhavaraja, an author of Trauma of Caste and founder of Equality Labs, was invited to speak at Google about caste bias, but she says some employees complained and it never happened. I had a Google VP News manager tell me, um, well, you know, caste is not a protected category. And that's just me as a speaker imagining what they're telling to workers. A Google spokesperson telling us in part, caste discrimination has no place in our workplace and it's prohibited in our policies. We have long hosted a variety of constructive conversations with external guests on these sorts of topics. Adding in this instance, there was specific conduct and internal posts that made employees feel targeted and retaliated against for raising concerns about a proposed talk. We made the decision not to move forward. These are the numbers. Have you guys heard about the new bill, SB 403? So we want to add caste in that protected category, just like race, religion, gender. Color, gender. What do you think a statewide ban would do. What kind of future are you hoping to create here in California? It's really about clarifying existing protections in the law and making them explicit. So caste is currently understood to be covered under existing protections of ancestry, race, and national origin. We Now a grassroots movement is spreading fast across the South Asian diaspora. We shall go ahead, go ahead. Prem and Alok at the forefront of this fight. I have experienced caste discrimination first time in the U.S. in many forms. In April, a contentious hearing at the state capitol in Sacramento, California, where anti-caste advocates are fighting to ban caste discrimination statewide. It is so irrelevant. We are living our American dream. We work hard. We, we are living our uh, uh, life. There is no need to ask anybody's caste. Caste does not exist in America. In Indian American diaspora, there is no caste discrimination. Tense clashes between people from both sides of the issue. Never once have I questioned, wondered, been asked um, what my caste was. I never knew up until this bill was introduced. And the moment this happened, I started getting questions about what my caste is and how this affects me. We strongly support this bill. We don't want any kind of caste discrimination. Thank you very much. SB 403 is the first of its kind in the nation. The bill would make caste a protected category in California's anti-discrimination laws alongside race, sexual orientation and gender. Introduced by State Senator Aisha Wahab. As our state becomes more diverse, our laws need to go further and deeper in communities and tackle the issues that matter to them. Do you think this is a turning point in history? 
Oh, 100%. But organizations like the Coalition of Hindus of North America are not on board, arguing there's no clear data to show caste discrimination even exists in the U.S. I mean, it's, it's, it's made up things that are targeting a certain community. Pushpita Prasad claims the very nature of anti-caste bills is discriminatory. Laws like SB 403, laws like what Seattle passed, they are different from every other civil rights protection that is in the current code. We object to this word caste. The word caste is in the Western lexicon is a Hindu phobic term. Many people associate caste with Hindu religion. This is true, but caste and caste-like differences and exclusions are also uh, in uh, evidence uh, in Muslim and Christian communities across South Asia. The fight over these bills, personal for everyone involved. When that incident of Google happened, um, I had to live in a safe house for two months because people were trying to attack me. They wanted to attack my elderly parents, find them and teach them a lesson. For me to be asked to be fitted for a bulletproof vest, obviously things have escalated. You know, they don't want this bill to be passed and we are gonna fight till our last breath to make sure that this bill is passed. SB 403 passed the California State Senate and could become law later this year. This is about caste abolitionism, right? The total abolition of caste and all of the ways in which it operates as a kind of existential, economic, social, and political form of inequality. This movement made international headlines in February when Seattle became the first jurisdiction outside of South Asia to ban caste discrimination. This is truly historic, having Seattle become the first jurisdiction globally outside South Asia to ban caste discrimination. And it really wouldn't have been possible unless we had had overwhelming unity among working people to uh, build a fighting movement. These South Asians who help make up the fabric of this country say they won't give up on their idea of the American dream. Prem eventually graduated from Cal State University with a degree in social work, recently spearheading efforts to ban caste discrimination at his alma mater. Last year, the university adding caste as a protected category in its system-wide anti-discrimination policy. I think that there is incredible hope in the way that we are turning pain into power. People are mobilizing to heal. I want to protect my children. I want to protect the next generation from this injuries, insult, bullying that I went through. I don't want them to go through this. I will do everything in my power to prevent that from happening to them. This ordinance is all about hope. It will create this ripple effect. This ordinance will have that ripple effect, and I hope that kind of creates a more inclusive environment and just creates a better world for everyone. They say it's all about protecting their children. Our thanks to Rena for that. Still much more to get to. Coming up, a store owner is charged in the deadly shooting of a 14-year-old. What police say happened before he allegedly pulled the trigger. Patricia Arquette tells us about the story that inspired her new dark comedy about a former felon who becomes a private investigator. But next, there are only two teams left. We take a look at the historic lead up to this year's NBA Finals by the numbers. at stake. So much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. 
From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Brooke Shields, the most photographed woman in the world. A sexualized child model. Exploitation. What happened to her isn't really about her, it's just about women. I let myself be vulnerable, and this is the first time I've ever spoken about what happened. I thought my one no should have been enough, you know. When someone like Brooke Shields talks about it, it makes a difference. I'm amazed that I survived any of it. With so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. Been a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. You never know what you're going to get on this show. That's all I'm going to tell you. Yes, Whoopi! This mic on? Can you hear me out there? Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely. 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 That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasured that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby. It was crazy. Behind the table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. I feel like the weight of the world is on my shoulders. I've seen a lot. I've been through a lot without ever having a chance to share my side of the story. Aaron Carter's life story in one sentence. The drugs, the drinking, everything goes back to tragedy. I just know I've turned it around and I've got a lot to say. There's always two sides to every story. This is where the newsmakers come first in the morning to be heard. America's number one morning show. How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? Wherever the story, ABC's Good Morning America is right there. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey, I'm David Muir. Wherever the story, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back, everyone. Miami was not MIA last night. The Heat survived a scare, and the NBA Finals matchup is now set, taking place in just a few days. Let's take a look by the numbers. After the Heat went up three games to none in the Eastern Conference Finals against the Boston Celtics, they seemed like they were on cruise control to the NBA Finals, but then the Celtics managed to come storming back, becoming the fourth team in NBA history to force a Game 7 after losing the first three games of a series. But they fell short of making history blown out by the Heat in Game 7 last night. NBA teams are now 0-151 after falling down 0-3 in a playoff series. As for the Heat, they are just the second number 8 seed to reach the NBA Finals after they knocked out the number 1 seeded Milwaukee Bucks in the first round, followed by wins over the Knicks and Celtics. They'll now face off against the number 1 seed in the Western Conference, the Denver Nuggets, who swept the LeBron-led Lakers in the Western Conference Finals and have been waiting for a full week now to find out their Finals opponent. Led by the dominant play of two-time league MVP Nikola Jokic, the Nuggets are in their first NBA Finals in franchise history. While the Heat may be the underdogs in this series, the franchise has now reached the Finals seven times since 2006, winning the NBA title three times during that span. Legendary Heat team president Pat Riley will be making his 19th NBA Finals appearance as a player, coach, or team executive. That's a stunning 25% of all NBA Finals in league history. Game one of the NBA Finals tips off Thursday night on ABC. And we still have much more ahead here on Prime. The new possible lead in the search for a missing mother and her boyfriend who both vanished on a cross-country trip. And a creative rescue. How police saved a bear after it got trapped inside of a family's car. What does it take to be America's number one news? 
It takes asking the straightforward, tough questions. Do you believe that Donald Trump should ever be president again? How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? The newsmaking interviews. You said that there were six friends. One of them was sick. Yeah. Do you have future political aspirations? Going to the front line. The search for survivors. How does this war end? And getting to the heart of the story. Thank you for being here. We'll be here for the long run. ABC News, number one in the morning. The number one newscast. Number one in daytime talk. Friday nights, Sunday mornings versus the competition. And the number one streaming news. Thank you for making ABC News America's trusted, straightforward, first choice. It's so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. But a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. You're along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. I feel like the weight of the world is on my shoulders. I've seen a lot. I've been through a lot without ever having a chance to share my side of the story. Aaron Carter's life story in one sentence. The drugs, the drinking, everything goes back to tragedy. I just know I've turned it around and I've got a lot to say. There's always two sides to every story. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're gonna love it. My mission was to go inside the KKK for the FBI. There's a white day coming in the United States. I can't quit. That's not an option. Grand Nighthawk infiltrating the KKK. Now streaming only on Hulu. A store owner is charged in the shooting of a teen. Mount Everest becomes garbage infested and trouble on the high seas. We have the footage of some terrifying moments. These stories and more in tonight's Rundown. There's a mother right now that is planning a funeral for her 14 year old. And that's, that can't happen. After a verbal confrontation between the store owner and his son with 14-year-old Cyrus Carmack Belton, a chase out of the store followed, according to law enforcement. At that point, the father shot uh, the young man in the back. We're charging the um, owner of the store, Rick Chow, with murder. Authorities with a possible lead in the search for a missing mother and her boyfriend who disappeared on a cross-country trip from Tennessee to California. Police say a security photo appears to show Nikki Alcaraz reportedly selling her phone at a Walmart in Redding, California. Authorities in Moriarty, New Mexico say she and Tyler Stratton had an altercation. Police released a picture showing her with a black eye. No charges were filed. Her family says the last time they heard from her was shortly after that incident, roughly three weeks ago. The terrifying moments on the high seas. It was 11 straight hours of pure hell. The Carnival Sunshine Cruise sailing into rough waters during a storm on the last night of its voyage from the Bahamas to Charleston Saturday. Water streaming into cabins, damaging hallways and this gift shop. But a Carnival spokesperson said that they made several announcements about the weather and the delay it caused in returning to Charleston, asking guests to use extra precaution. 
A mountain guide revealed a major trash dump on Mount Everest. Disturbing images show piles of garbage at one of the camps, with a guide calling it the dirtiest he's ever seen. Widespread litter, including paper, wrappers, hiking equipment, oxygen tanks, and abandoned tents. Climbers say more people attempting to hike up the mountain, and the difficulty with managing such a remote area has left authorities without the proper tools to enforce garbage collection. Chicago White Sox reliever Liam Hendricks played in Monday's game, his first outing since recovering from non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Hendricks got several standing ovations, both before he took the mound and when he entered the game in the top of the eighth inning. He pitched one inning, both teams standing and clapped for Hendricks, as did the Memorial Day crowd at Guaranteed Rate Field as he entered the game. Please bear with us as we share some appalling footage released by Nevada authorities showing the moment deputies released a bear who was stuck in a vehicle. Although these deputies are from Cub Scouts, they were able to fashion a rope to release the bear from a safe distance, barely making it out unharmed. Now to the latest in our series, Streamlined, where we bring you some of the biggest films and TV series hitting digital screens worldwide. Speaking with some of the actors and creators behind them, tonight we've been mesmerized by her work from the cult classic Modern Romance to her Oscar-winning performance in 2014's Boyhood. In a wide-ranging interview, Patricia Arquette sat down with our Phil Lipoff to talk about her starring role in the new Apple series High Desert, how she prepares for her role in the critically acclaimed series Severance, and what directing teaches her about acting. As you can see, it's a really great neighborhood. Oh, yeah, it's a great park. The house the has market. great bones. Oh. The character you play, Peggy, there are other characters in other shows right now, this kind of dark comedy, or at least people, um, flawed human beings mm. that give an audience the reason to like them. Does it resonate with you when you're looking at a script and a character like Peggy? Well, part of what I responded was I thought it was kind of a counterculture comedy. There's a little punk rock edge running through it. I do think people are complicated and we have light parts and dark parts and especially people like Peggy who are struggling with their own issues. You know, they don't really want to look at their own pain, so they kind of create a cyclone around them so they really don't have to stop and look at what that pain is. Some reviewers have said it's a wacky tour de force comedy, a whodunit, also, you know, a lot of heart. I think the heart comes from many places, but Peggy primarily. Um, what What's it like playing the character? It's really fun. I mean, she's she's constantly sizing up the room, seeing what's going on. How could she get something out of it? When I had money, we all had money. From dealing drugs. It was a little pot, maybe some hash. There was cocaine. Well, that was much later, and I did it. I didn't sell it. Oh, wow. OK, calm down. She's also collecting all these kind of broken bird people mm -hmm. who are weaker than her in a way. So she's got this sort of motherly protection feeling over a lot of people. Although she shouldn't really be in that position because she is a disaster. So it's this, <laughs> you know, but they're a little more vulnerable than she is. She's struggling with addiction. Um, and then she decides to be a PI. <laughs> that's, kind <Yeah>. of a, <laughs> that's kind of a hard turn. Uh, was, was that something that attracted you to the script too? Yeah, well, it was loosely based on one of our writers, Nancy Fitchman's sister, Marjorie, who struggled with addiction issues, and also said to her at one point, you know, I think I'm gonna be a PI. And she thought, well, that's crazy, but it's actually the most sane thing you've ever said, because you'd probably be pretty good. There's something about addicts and their hustle and the way they try to get their needs met that kind of makes sense for a, for a PI. Why, with comedy, why, how, why do you think comedy is important in a show like this? I feel like comedy and uh, we, we're this weird animal that laughs. I mean, that's weird, right? There's not a lot of creatures that use 
humor as a survival mechanism, as a bonding mechanism. And I think for a lot of families, comedy is, a, is something that they share. It's a shared language. Humor has helped us out a lot of, from our darkest moments. Let's talk about Severance for a minute because it was, it's been picked up. Uh, I think it's such a fascinating um, premise. You know, how many times have you said to yourself, I'm gonna leave work at work, you know, I'm not gonna bring my personal issues to work. Um, this just takes it to another level. This is just next yeah. level stuff. It's funny when you say that, because my work is the opposite. Acting, you actually have to take, or m many people, their process is to take their home into their work. You might have a scene where you're crying, and you might remember when your mom died, and that might help you cry. So you're constantly uh, bringing your work home. We learn our lines at home. Our work doesn't really stop. There's a blur in all of these things. What's it like to, to play that character? It's funny. I mean, it's so confined and strict and the opposite of Peggy in High Desert. It's structurally, even visually, the way that it looks, the, the composition of the shots. I confer upon you the advanced role of department chief. Congratulations. A handshake is available upon request. Thank you. May I have a handshake? Is it weird playing those two characters? so close together? It's actually really great to do that. You know, just to like, okay, that clearly goes into the Cobell category. This over here is this whole different tone, voice, timing, you know, energy pattern, expression. Peggy holds nothing back, and Cobell holds everything back. It's like a ball full of emotion and then emotion less. Yeah, it's like chaos, wildness, and then, just strict structure. He says an actor is one easier to play for you than the other? Peggy was a lot of fun to play, I'll say that about her. And also all the actors we had, Brad Garrett and Bernadette Peters and, and Rupert Friend and Christine Taylor and Keir. Eric, I, I mean, they just, the hardest thing really was not laughing in the middle of the take. What are you supposed to be? A real PI? What are you playing at? I'm not hiring. I'm a natural detective. You need me. And I need this job. Be here Monday morning at 9 a.m. I don't get up before 11. As a director, I mean, you love acting. You're so good at it. And now all of a sudden you're directing actors. <laughs> Do you think actors direct differently than directors who haven't acted? Well, the things that I thought would be easy as a, a director weren't necessarily, like the language. Everyone still has their own language. They need, each actor has their own process. But I did feel that I was able to edit the movie specifically around acting. Mm -hmm. That's all I cared about. I was gonna edit completely to performances. And that I feel really proud of. Because I don't know that even my own performances, that it's always been strictly that. It's served many different things, and sometimes, you know, your performance is not as great as it could have been because of that. But for, with them, I really just wanted to really edit for them. Our thanks to Phil and Patricia Arquette for that conversation. And that's our show for this hour. I'm Lindsay Davis. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Hour, a member of the Manson family will soon be paroled. How soon she could be released? And with tensions escalating between Ukraine and Russia, a former U.S. ambassador to Ukraine tells us what the latest moves could mean for the future of the conflict. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. Right now in America, with so much at stake, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. 
This is where the newsmakers come first in the morning to be heard. America's number one morning show. How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? Wherever the story, ABC's Good Morning America is right there. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. You never know what you're going to get on this show. That's all I'm going to tell you. Yes, Whoopi! This mic on? Can you hear me out there? Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely. 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 That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasured that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby! It was crazy. Behind the table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. I feel like the weight of the world is on my shoulders. I've seen a lot. I've been through a lot without ever having a chance to share my side of the story. Aaron Carter's life story in one sentence. The drugs, the drinking, everything goes back to tragedy. I just know I've turned it around and I've got a lot to say. There's always two sides to every story. Monterey Park, California. I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News live. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We're following those stories and much more, including a devastating apartment building collapse in Iowa with search and rescue teams on site working day and night to find those still missing. Plus, it turned heads and puzzled locals. What officials now say caused the historic Venice Canal to turn a bright shade of green. And sister singing duo, Tegan and Sarah, tell us how they pulled from their own lives to create their new graphic novel, Junior High. But we do begin with the fallout after that apartment building collapse in Iowa and the perilous situation rescuers face tonight. At any moment, the building could come crashing down, but there may still be people alive inside. The building in Davenport, Iowa, collapsed Sunday afternoon. Tonight, five people remain unaccounted for. The building was slated to be demolished today, but those plans were scrapped by the city after a ninth survivor was rescued from an apartment on Monday, presenting quite the conundrum. With more rescues, there is grave risk. Alex Perez leads us off tonight from Davenport, Iowa. Tonight in Davenport, Iowa, there are growing calls for authorities to keep searching this collapsed apartment building for residents who are still missing. The frickin' building just collapsed. Less than 24 hours after part of this building crumbled to the ground, rescue operations were called off after search dogs, drones, and thermal imaging found no signs of life. But tonight, in about face, the city putting plans to demolish the building on hold. At an emotional press conference, officials now acknowledging five residents are unaccounted for, including Ryan Hitchcock and Brandon Colvin, who they believe are still in the building. We're very sympathetic to the possibility that there's two people, that there's two people still left inside. She is alive. It comes hours after Lisa Brooks was finally able to reach her phone to call for help. Rescuers working up against an unsteady building to get her to safety. I'm just so afraid that I was gonna die and don't see my kids, my grandkids.
Brandon Colvin's aunt wants crews to keep searching. And up there where you see those clothes hanging neatly, that was his department. Knowing that the city was considering demolishing this as early as today. It's like burying them. The cause of the collapse is now under investigation. The building had a history of complaints. And last week, this section of the exterior wall was being repaired. Seems that repair came too late. Our thanks to Alex for that. Now to Washington, where the debt ceiling agreement reached over the Memorial Day weekend between President Biden and House Speaker McCarthy is facing a major test of support before a full House vote. Both sides are trying to sell the deal to their members to try to get it across the finish line and avoid a catastrophic default. ABC senior congressional correspondent Rachel Scott has the latest. Now that President Biden and House Speaker Kevin McCarthy have struck a deal to avoid a catastrophic default, the challenge, getting it through Congress. And tonight, fierce resistance from some of the most conservative House Republicans, the Freedom Caucus. I want to be very clear. Not one Republican should vote for this deal. Yes. Not job. one. The two-year deal would claw back $30 billion in COVID relief, rescind $20 billion in IRS funding, end Biden's freeze on student loan repayments in August, and add new work requirements for some Americans on food assistance. Conservative Republicans say it doesn't go nearly far enough. You read the bill? Yeah. Where do you stand? It's a terrible bill. Plain and simple. And you're a firm no? Unless something changes on the bill? Yeah, absolutely. I'm triple no. You said that Republicans were outsmarted by Democrats. Yeah, they got, we got fleeced uh, 100%. Some Republicans saying McCarthy himself should go. The speaker brushing it off. What's your message to some of the holdouts, Republicans who say that Republicans were outsmarted in this deal? That's interesting. So how were we outsmarted? The largest cut in the history of Congress, the biggest ability to pull money back. Tonight, at least 25 House Republicans say they will vote against the bill, which means McCarthy will need Democratic votes to get it over the finish line. But House progressives aren't sold. Many progressives, including me, lean no uh, because the bill does contain taking some folks like 53 and 54 year olds off of their food stamps. Our thanks to Rachel. Next tonight to the war in Ukraine, drones have hit residential areas in Moscow for the first time in this conflict. One has hit near Putin's country home. You can see smoke from that explosion just over the skyline. Russia is blaming Ukraine for the strike. Ukraine denies it. The question now is how will Putin respond? ABC's Tom Sophie Burridge reports from Ukraine. Tonight, Russia promising the toughest possible response after a wave of explosive drones hit a wealthy district of Moscow. Explosions only three miles from President Putin's country residence. Here, a drone clearly visible. Russia saying there were eight in total. These videos circulating online, this one appearing to show Moscow's air defense in action, shooting most of them down. A Ukrainian official suggesting it's now not just Ukraine that can be bombarded by drones. Russian President Vladimir Putin calling it a terrorist attack. Waves of Russian missiles and drones striking Kiev three nights running. This apartment blown away, a woman killed, with fighting escalating on the front lines. We're with a Ukrainian tank brigade. Their tanks are hidden in the trees just back from the front lines. We can hear intense artillery fire not far from here. And these guys are waiting for the command to move. Ukraine getting ready for a major offensive. For the latest in the fight between Ukraine and Russia, we're joined now by former U.S. Ambassador to Ukraine, Marie Yovanovitch, whose memoir, Lessons from the Edge, is now out in paperback. Thank you so much for being here. Ambassador, I first want to get your reaction to this move by Ukraine to, to strike inside Russia with drone attacks essentially at Putin's doorstep. Are you surprised at all by the aggressiveness of this action? And what do you think that it could mean for the overall conflict? Well, I think Russia has enjoyed sanctuary, as they call it, from, um, you know, from the effects of the war um, and being out of reach of Ukrainian weapons since, uh, since the very beginning of the war, keeping its uh, troops safe, keeping the weapons out of harm's way, and most crucially, the civilian population. So this is definitely a turn. Um, and I think um, we're, we're also seeing Russia uh, with its, um, you know, massive attacks on the civilian population in Ukraine, um, most uh, specifically on Kyiv, the capital, uh, with three waves, um, you know, overnight um, and then um, during the day, uh, most recently, uh, and, and really brazen attacks on the, the, the civilian population in Kyiv.
Uh, you served for several years as a diplomat in Ukraine. You recently returned from a trip to Kyiv. What did you observe about the state of the conflict and how Ukrainians on the ground there are coping more than one year into this war? Yeah. So I was in the capital, which is uh, relatively far away from the front line, although all of Ukraine is the front line, as we've come to understand it, with um, these attacks on the civilian population and civilian infrastructure. And um, what I can tell you is, you know, talking to friends, uh, former colleagues, um, officials, is that the Ukrainians are as uh, courageous and committed and really confident as ever. Um, and uh, certainly being in the capital of Kyiv, which is a beautiful and very green uh, city in the springtime, uh, it was a little incongruous uh, with the nighttime attacks and now the daytime attack. Um, but um, I, I would tell you that the Ukrainians are not giving up. They are not going to be terrorized by the Russians. You, of course, were the center of the first impeachment trial of former President Trump over his alleged pressure put on President Zelensky over military aid for Ukraine, which you detail in your book. Watching President Zelensky over the past year, what's your perspective on, on what he's been able to accomplish as a wartime leader of his nation? Um, I, you know, I mean, hats off to President Zelensky. Not only has he unified and led the Ukrainian people and the Ukrainian military, he's unified the world uh, with his um, his own uh, courage and his ability to communicate and talk to world leaders and world populations about what is at stake and what um, what Ukraine needs in order to continue this uh, really important fight. Uh, we recently saw President Biden start to back the idea of getting F-16 equipment and training to Ukraine. Do you think that it was a mistake for him to have held out this long, given that Zelensky has been calling for that air capability for months? Yeah. I mean, I, I think what's important is that um, the uh, Biden administration has overall uh, done a really good job in supporting Ukraine and in leading, you know, the coalition of the willing, so to speak, um, in, in terms of other uh, allies and partners to support Ukraine. Um, what's going to be important moving forward is that there is a strategic plan for victory for Ukraine. Um, there's been sort of an incremental approach to date. Um, I think it's worked, but I think um, it's important to get as much equipment to Ukraine as quickly as possible so that Ukraine can win and win decisively. When we spoke a little over a year ago, you said at the time that any diplomacy between Russia and Ukraine would, quote, play out over time, unfortunately. Knowing what you know about Vladimir Putin, do you see any diplomatic off-ramp to end this conflict at any point? Well, I, I think right now um, Putin is um, trying to create the facts on the ground for, um, for a Russian victory. I mean, I, I don't see him backing off at all. Um, and, you know, any talk of diplomacy um, by the Russians is really just a ruse um, so that they can, you know, rearm, rest and recoup and start all over again. So, no, I don't think Russia's given up at all. You talked about the, the courage and the confidence of the people of Ukraine. Yeah. How do you anticipate this ending? With a Ukrainian victory. Um, I think that's the only way it can, um, it can end. Um, my military colleagues and uh, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, uh, Mark Milley, has, uh, has said publicly, there's no pathway to a Russian military victory. Um, and I am um, pretty convinced that Ukraine will, will win in the end. And I hope it's sooner rather than later. Ambassador Marie Yovanovitch, we thank you so much for your insight. You. And Lessons from the Edge of Memoir is now available in paperback wherever books are sold. Thank you. A federal death penalty trial is now underway for the man accused of killing 11 in a mass shooting at a Pittsburgh synagogue. The trial of Robert Bowers began today with opening statements. Bowers is accused of storming the Tree of Life synagogue on October 27th of 2018, gunning down 11 people in the deadliest anti-Semitic attack in American history. Bowers has pleaded not guilty. He was willing to plead guilty in exchange for a life sentence, but federal prosecutors would not agree to that deal. Singer Danny Lay is being accused of a DUI hit and run in Miami Beach, Florida. The 28-year-old was arrested on a felony hit and run charge. Police accused her of driving drunk and hitting a moped rider on South Beach, dragging the scooter for about a block before officers caught up with her. The moped rider survived but suffered a kidney laceration, a spinal fracture. The officers later found an empty bottle of Don Julio 1942 tequila in the car. Two breath tests came back at nearly twice the legal limit. A California appeals court has upheld the parole of a Manson family member who was sentenced to life in prison for being part of a crew that murdered a married couple in 1969 at the order of Charles Manson. ABC's national correspondent Matt Gutman has the details. Tonight, the California appeals court upholding Manson family member Leslie Van Houten's parole, which could come as early as this week. 
Manhattan had been part of a crew that murdered Leno and Rosemary LaBianca in the sweltering summer of 69 for no reason other than Charles Manson ordered them to. The LaBianca murder was grisly and came just a day after the murder of pregnant actress Sharon Tate and four others in her Hollywood Hills home. Manson distanced himself from the murders in this memorable 1994 interview with Diane Sawyer. I never told anybody to do anything other than what they wanted to do. And if they wanted to do murder, that was okay with you? That was none of my business, woman. I'm a convict. I'm an outlaw. I'm a rebel. I'm not a Sunday school teacher. Manson had convinced his cult, known as the Manson family, that a race war was coming, inspired by the Beatles song, Helter Skelter. Since then, Van Houten had been granted parole five times, each rejected by a California governor. The appeals court writing Governor Newsom's latest refusal amounts to unsupported intuition that Van Houten might reoffend. Unless Leslie looked deep inside herself and saw what got her there. She led a lot of the rehabilitative programs, a lot of inmates who got released, and that's always the first step in turning the corner and moving forward. Our thanks to Matt for that. Still much more to get to tonight. Coming up from Academy Award nominated musicians to authors, sister singing duo Tegan and Sarah tell us how they pull from their own lives to create their new graphic novel, Junior High. But next, mystery solved. What officials say caused the historic Venice Canal to turn a bright shade of green. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. NBC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. <laughs> Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Reporting from Hong Kong, I'm Britt Clennett. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. We're tracking several headlines around the world. Disturbing images tonight show piles of garbage at one of the base camps at Mount Everest. A mounting dive recorded the widespread litter, including hiking equipment, oxygen tanks, and abandoned tents. Climbers are calling on Nepal to do a better job of enforcing waste cleanup rules on the world's highest mountain to save it from becoming a garbage wasteland. NATO plans to deploy 700 more troops to Kosovo to try and stop the violent protests after clashes between NATO-led peacekeepers and ethnic Serb protesters resulted in nearly 80 people being injured over the weekend. The clashes grew out of a confrontation last week after Albanian officials voted to boycott Serbs from entering municipal buildings to take office. And mystery solved in Venice, Italy tonight. Over the weekend, the world-famous Grand Canal mysteriously turned green. Investigators discovered the green color was caused by a chemical used in underwater construction, which helps identify potential leaks. The local environmental agency says it could take several days for the canal to return to its normal color. 
Growing up can be a roller coaster from fun experiences to awkward encounters. Many of those coming of age moments play out during junior high. Our next guests, iconic indie pop duo Tegan and Sarah Quinn, candidly share their own experiences, reliving them in a semi autobiographical book, Junior High. The graphic novel explores everything from music, sisterhood, and also coming out. Tegan and Sarah, kind enough to join us in studio tonight. Welcome to the show. Thank you. <laughs> so, you all started out with uh, your first memoir. 2019 about high school that had tremendous success ended up becoming a TV show uh, what made you decide you know we're gonna peel back the onion a little <laughs> deeper and go back to junior high we just hadn't done enough uh, enough trauma dumping I guess <laughs> self-reflection <laughs> no we actually um, started talking about junior high at the same time as high school and we wanted to sort of take those themes and those sort of seminal moments in our life from high school and bring them back into junior high and, and for a younger audience, really. So, um, and junior high was traumatizing, but this book is not traumatizing. This is a more tender, lighthearted, aspirational, um, aspirational mm -hmm. look at junior high. So you all talk about growing up and, and revealing your identities and sisterhood, mm -hmm. uh, sexuality. Mm -hmm. Why was it important for you to share these coming of age stories, not just individually, but collectively? I mean, we've been playing music now since we were in high school. And one of the coolest parts of being in Tegan and Zara is our audience and the community that we've managed to connect with over all these years. And one of the things they constantly tell us is how um, important it is that we talk about ourselves. Writing high school and now junior high, it's about us just sharing what happened to us, normalizing silly things like having a crush on a girl, you know, or fighting with your sister, or in my case, crying every first day of school mm. until I was 13. Mm. You know, like I just I was think- 13? Yeah. I remember being 14. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm just like, I, I, I don't know, like, we're happy to share it, you know? And you talk about fighting with your sister. You know, many people assume that identical twins in particular are super tight, right, and really mm -hmm. close. But you guys are open and honest. You talk about some fractures in your relationship early on. How were you able to evolve and, and ultimately move past that? Therapy. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, I think music truly was what brought us back together in adolescence. We were having such a difficult time. We really were pulling apart. We were trying to figure out who we were as individuals. And then we started playing music and it was this really wonderful, safe way to be in a room with each other and not be fighting over clothes or the telephone or whatever nonsense we were fighting over. So in some ways, music and then therapy when we were adults. <laughs> <laughs> Both coming out as queer early on, were you able to have those conversations with each other? Was there one that first said, you know, I'm feeling this kind of way and had to really break <laughs> the ice between the two of you? I think that was the big shock when we wrote our memoir, High School, was that we didn't. We didn't come out to each other. It was a secret. We sort of kept hidden from one another. What's amazing about junior high is we were able to, you know, fictionalize parts of our story. And so in junior high, young Tegan and Sarah get to talk about their feelings in a way that we didn't. We are in our 40s, but we have been in the music industry for 25 years, which I think keeps us really young and connected to a younger audience. You know, this book specifically was written for more of a junior high audience. You know, we wanted to we wanted to make a story that felt um, approachable and safe while also pushing some of those boundaries of things that happen at that age. You also have a mean girl character, of course. Every, How can you uh, not? Every junior not? high school yeah. book needs to have that. <laughs> Talk about bullying when you, when you were growing up. I mean, it was so different because we grew up in the 90s, so mm -hmm. there weren't cell phones, so it was sort of... It was um, undocumented. It was yeah. undocumented, <laughs> yes, very good way to put it. The kind of bullying that we dealt with was minimal compared to many people, but it was still important to put in the story. I think Sarah and I, we really struggled because we were we were total tomboys. We were queer when we were, you know, that age. We already knew we were different. Our goal was to not re-traumatize people reading the book, but to kind of poke fun at some of the things that happened to us. Tell us about the Tegan and Sarah Foundation, the point of the organization, the thrust of its mission. We raise money for um, LGBTQ organizations, often grassroots organizations that center women and girls. Um, when organizations that center women and girls tend to make half as much um, in terms of fundraising as men organizations. So our goal is just to try to fund those that don't get funded. Lots of grassroots organizations around the country, one of our biggest programs is LGBTQ summer camps. We send kids to over, I think, almost 30 camps now. So LGBTQ kids who've never met other kids like them, who've never been to a space with tons of kids like themselves, um, we send them to summer camp every year. So it's been an amazing experience. I mean, it's it's so cliche to say that, like, giving back feels good, but it really does. <laughs> Look at those smiles. Yeah. All right, Tegan and Sarah Quinn, we thank you so much for joining us. Want to let our viewers know their new book, Junior High, is now available wherever books are sold.
And still to come, she's a groundbreaking costume designer whose career spans four decades. Ruth E. Carter opens the book on some of her most iconic designs. I feel like the weight of the world is on my shoulders. I've seen a lot. I've been through a lot without ever having a chance to share my side of the story. Aaron Carter's life story in one sentence. The drugs, the drinking, everything goes back to tragedy. I just know I've turned it around and I've got a lot to say. There's always two sides to every story. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Right now in America, with so much at stake, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Welcome back. Ruthie Carter is an Oscar winner and history-making costume designer, and now she can add author to her name after writing a book about her nearly four-decade career working on some of the most successful movies of all time. Her book is called The Art of Ruthie Carter. ABC's Steve Osinsami sat down with her. Ready, go! She's the world-famous designer who's behind the looks in some of Hollywood's most critically and financially successful films of all time. You march those people into rural Alabama, it's got to be open season. With a long career that began with Spike Lee's 1988 film School Days. Ruth Carter is a proud graduate of a historically black college and university, and much of her work opens a window into what it means to be black American. And in her new book, The Art of Ruthie Carter, she opens that window even wider. We met her in Atlanta for a rare interview. You're never in front of the camera except on special occasions. Now I am. Yeah, special occasions like what, the Oscar ceremony? <laughs> Here are the nominees for achievement in costume design. She's the first black American to be nominated and to win the Academy Award for Best Costume Design. Black Panther Ruth Carter! And the first black woman who's ever won two Oscars. I've always been a storyteller, not only with my work as a costume designer, but also in just telling about the stories uh, that happen behind the camera. In the pages of her new book, she shows the creation, the fittings, and the drawings that led to some of her most iconic costumes. A lot of people don't realize that it's not just fashion, it's not just coming up with a garment, a costume, and putting it on something. You have an experience with people. You have an experience with the directors and the actors, and those are the stories I like to tell in this book. These are from Do the Right Thing and Malcolm X, and this one that actresses Natalie DeSell Reed and Halle Berry wore in the movie Baps, where they made comedy gold. You just turn these two handles right here. Well, you know the scene at the bidet mm -hmm. when she doesn't know what it is and the water starts spurting. Yeah. <laughs> Whoa, no! I thought, wouldn't it be funny if not only the water was spurting around, that she was slipping, you know, and she just couldn't get her balance, and so she's gonna need like a plastic or rubber suit for that. So that's what inspired the material. What is it that you want me to not forget to tell America? Don't forget um, that I'm not over here behind a curtain sewing on a sewing machine. Um, I am actually a designer. And that means that I have uh, imagination, a vision that I'm creating out of care and love. 
quite a designer. Our thanks to Steve for that. And that's our show for tonight. I'm Lindsay Davis. ABC News Live is here for you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, Roku, the ABC News app, and of course on abcnews.com. Have a great night. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland.